All right. Uh, well, uh, thank you, uh, Leslie. Um, and as the title of my talk uh, shows here, we're going to be talking about viruses and parasites that are important uh, to public health, um, uh, particularly uh, in relation to uh, uh, biosolids and uh, manure land application. And for some reason, this is, there we go. All right, so when we talk about viruses, one of the most important aspects of, of a virus is that they tend to be host-specific. And when I'm saying they're host-specific, I'm saying that a pig virus uh, tends to only infect pigs, uh, while a human virus tends to only infect humans. So because of that, when we talk about land-applied fertilizers, such as manure, um, and we're talking about risks associated with viruses, we have to bring into the conversation class B of bile solids. Now, for those of us that don't know, bile solids are municipal wastewater treatment plant uh, uh, solid residuals. Uh, basically, it means that what you flush down the toilet, the solid aspect of that, uh, it gets treated uh, to a certain level and is land applied. And you can see a picture here in the bottom right hand corner. So the reason we're really interested in a lot of these viruses is that you know, of the uh, little over 9 million uh, foodborne illnesses that the uh, CDC estimates occur every year, more than half of them are associated with noroviruses. And uh, the ones that are not associated with any one specific pathogen, or at least that don't have a, a definitive etiological agent, uh, there's probably a good chance that those are also associated with some sort of virus uh, as well at least one that we don't know of. Um, and that's really what makes viruses so important from a public health perspective. And of course, when we're talking about fecal oral viruses, such as what we're gonna talk about now, uh, of course, that's where class B bile solids come into play, uh, as well as the parasites uh, that are involved here too. So when we talk about exposure to manure and bile solids, we really look at this. Uh, if the pathogen is present, uh, you're going to be exposed uh, to uh, the pathogen uh, via some sort of fecal oral route of exposure. And that's going to be maybe fecally contaminated fresh uh, vegetables that are consumed, or in this case, uh, this child is eating uh, soil, uh, uh, fecally uh, contaminated soil uh, is one another route of exposure, or even aerosol exposures. Uh, but we're really focusing in on the fecal oral route of exposure for uh, viruses and parasites that we're going to discuss today. So getting back to the host specificity and the parasitic life cycles that we kind of touched on earlier. So an example of a virus here, we have this virus infecting the host. And notice there are very specific proteins that the virus is interacting with before it uh, infects the host cell. And that is important for a virus. If it doesn't see uh, for instance, this particular protein right here, if it doesn't see that protein, uh, the, in that case, the virus will no longer be able to infect uh, the cell, and of course, that's, that's the end of the virus uh, it, it, uh, infection and uh, replication cycle. It won't be able to replicate. So that's why a pig virus uh, will infect uh, pigs only, uh, generally speaking, and a human virus will only infect humans. So when you're sick with your cold, uh, you know, there's, there's no chance you're going to pass that cold on to your dog, uh, which is a question I've received many, many times before in the past. Now, parasites are a little different. Uh, they have more complex life cycles. Uh, and these parasites, for instance, this is a uh, life cycle associated with uh, cryptosporidium. Uh, but the parasites are a little bit uh, uh, more promiscuous than viruses, a little less uh, specific. For instance, this oocyst here is ingested by this human. Uh, the human then gets uh, colonized in the intestine and secretes more oocysts, which contaminate water or food, of which case they're then ingested again, and then you have another uh, cycle of, uh, of downstream uh, cycle here. So you could substitute uh, a cow right here, and it wouldn't make a difference for cryptosporidium. Uh, and of course, you would have the exact same uh, cycle. Now. More, some of these uh, parasites actually are far more complex than that very simplistic crypto uh, life cycle, and they involve multiple hosts. Here you have pigs, you have uh, rats, and of course you have the human. 
uh, here. And these life cycles are far more complex. And basically what I'm showing you here is that for this particular worm, uh, if you were to be exposed to manure that was uh, excreted from this uh, pig here, uh, it wouldn't pose a threat because the life cycle is not, uh, uh, that, that stage in the life cycle is, is not present in the manure, but it is present in the tissue, the muscle of the pig. And of course, if you were to consume that, that tissue, that's where you would become infected. And then your part of the life cycle would then uh, proceed. So getting on to some of the imp manure important viruses, and there's only a few that we're talking about here. Uh, because, like I said, viruses are very host-specific. So but there are a few that have made the jump from animal uh, to human. And that one of them is hepatitis E virus. Uh, hepatitis E uh, virus is, is a very uh, common form of uh, enterically transmitted uh, hepatitis, meaning it's a fecal oral uh, uh, hepatitis uh, uh, transmission. And you can see the worldwide distribution here. Uh, and t you don't see it much in the U.S., and it's not very common here in the U.S., but it is common in areas where you don't necessarily have uh, as high of uh, water quality standards as we have here in this country. Uh, hepatitis E, as we know, hepatitis causes liver inflammation, and uh, this particular uh, uh, virus, uh, of course, is um, uh, it's one that you don't necessarily get rid of, uh, so you, this is kind of one of the situations where you're stuck with it. Uh, uh, for some time. Um, HEV does infect pigs and it does infect humans. So it's one of the ones that uh, uh, has made the jump from pig to human. On to the uh, avian influenza. Uh, so avian influenza virus uh, is one that we know of and we've heard in the news cycle uh, over the last 10 years quite a bit. Uh, we know that AI uh, infects wild birds and uh, can also infect commercial birds. And we know of the catastrophic uh, economic losses associated with commercial poultry operations that have been infected with uh, outbreaks of, of AI, of uh, uh, avian influenza. Uh, with the wild birds transfer uh, the infection to commercial birds, and of course then you have uh, massive culling of, of these particular uh, birds and these commercial birds, and then leads to quite a, quite a few losses, uh, economically speaking. Uh, generally speaking, when we talk about AIs, uh, we don't really uh, talk about transfers to humans because it, does, it doesn't really happen. But being that it's an influenza virus, it is very prone. It could, there's potential there for it to jump to humans, uh, very easily to jump to humans. Uh, coronaviruses, uh, we heard a little bit about that earlier, uh, particularly SARS and MERS uh, in this situation. These are animal viruses and they have successfully made the jump uh, to humans. Uh, and they typically will cause cold-like symptoms, but uh, in some cases, such as SARS and MERS, they cause uh, uh, fairly severe uh, respiratory uh, uh, syndromes here. Uh, but like I said, these particular viruses are a little bit more difficult uh, to spread to humans, so you generally don't uh, see that spread uh, very often. So on to the viruses that are adapted to humans. Those, we are talking about the class B bile solids and important viruses. And we really start with the enteric viruses. And I'm gonna kind of say a few things that are gonna apply to this slide and the next. And that is, uh, these viruses are all very common viruses. You uh, can become, uh, you come into contact with these viruses often, whether you're walking to the neighborhood uh, grocery store, you're going to your next meeting, uh, or you're shaking hands at your next meeting. Uh, so remember that you have no idea what the person uh, that you just shook hands with, you have no idea what they're going through uh, right this second, or uh, what they went through last night hovered over a toilet uh, the, the previous night. So you have no idea uh, what, they're, what they're going through. So keep that in mind when you're talking about these viruses, because you come into contact with them often. Uh, the first family that we're talking about are the enteroviruses. Uh, most famous uh, polio virus is actually, or infamous uh, polio virus is in this group. Uh, there's also Coxsackie virus, Echovirus, and Enterovirus uh, that are also in this group. There's multiple types of viruses in this group, and they cause a handful of things, uh, uh, hand, foot, and mouth disease. If you have kids, of course, that's the common uh, disease. I'll run through daycares, uh, diarrhea, cold-like symptoms, uh, conjunctivitis. Uh, these sorts of things are very common with these particular viruses. Norovirus, this is a particular favorite of mine. 
Uh, norovirus is one that we probably there's a good chance that maybe half to two thirds of us on the phone have maybe come into contact with this and lived to tell the tale. And that is norovirus is our cruise ship virus. Uh, it's the virus that you generally will hear on the news about a cruise ship that's pulled into port and had so many people sick and uh, these sorts of things. So it's a virus that's also very common. You'll come into contact with it uh, quite often uh, in non-agricultural settings. You'll come into contact with it at your grocery store and come into contact with it at your church and, and whatnot. Uh, it's a cause of diarrhea and vomiting. It's known as the 24-hour flu. Um, and so, of course, you hear plenty about norovirus in the news. Adenovirus is another one. It's a multiple types of viruses in, in this group. Uh, viruses, uh, they cause diarrhea, upper respiratory tract infections, but probably most uh, associated with adenovirus is conjunctivitis or pink eye uh, associated with adenovirus. So these are all fecally transmitted uh, viruses uh, for the most part. Of course, some of these uh, can be transmitted via uh, uh, more cold-like symptoms too. Uh, hepatitis A, we talked about hepatitis E earlier. This is hepatitis A, which is the uh, more human adapted virus. Uh, of course, this is uh, one that is extremely contagious and it's one that's uh, been known to cause outbreaks in restaurants uh, associated with green onions, frozen strawberries. There is a worldwide distribution of it. Our levels actually in the U.S. have gone down year upon year for the last 10 years or so. Uh, and so that's just a result of uh, better sanitation, better food quality, that sort of thing. Uh, food safety measures uh, have really kept our numbers uh, down or making it go down. But the hepatitis A is an extremely contagious virus. Uh, looking at some of the manure and class B biosolids important parasites. Uh, I grouped these two together because they cause very similar symptoms. Uh, Cryptosporidium parvum and Giardia lamblia. Uh, they both cause severe diarrhea, uh, stomach cramps, uh, pain, uh, gas. They are rough uh, parasites. Uh, they one thing about these guys is that they uh, do colonize a number of hosts, uh, of cows, pigs, humans, wild animals. Uh, so they can co colonize quite a few uh, people or uh, uh, animals. And uh, as such, you, know, you do come into contact them, with them with manure and with bile solids. Uh, the oocysts are very resistant uh, to the environment. Likewise, the cysts are also very resistant to the environment. So. Uh, they they do survive out there, and of course, if you go camping, it's one of the things you have to worry about when you're camping and drinking water from any fresh stream. Uh, remember, any fresh stream was once uh, a deer's toilet, so just keep that in mind. Uh, nematodes and infectious worms. Um, nematodes and infectious worms. The reason I even throw these in uh, is simply because of this helmet ova right here. Uh, the EPA uh, uh, still uses helmet ova as a metric to determine whether or not you have quality uh, class A bile solids uh, treatment processes. Uh, basically, they look for the lack of uh, these OVA um, in, in your class A bile solids. And so they still utilize it, but for the most part, and you can see here from the worldwide distribution, we don't really see uh, ascaris in infections in, in this country, uh, but uh, you do see it worldwide in other uh, countries. And here are the worms for anyone who just had lunch. Uh, there you go, right there. Um, another thing uh, that I like to talk about here are Trichinella, uh, Tania. Uh, these guys are worms, uh, tapeworm right here, Tania. Uh, and here's another lovely picture for post lunch. Uh, Tania is a, um, uh, these worms are not shed in feces uh, per se, the, the infectious. Uh, stage of the life cycle is actually shed or is actually in the meat. So consumption of uh, contaminated meat is, is where your concern is there, not in the manure or feces. One of the things that we talk about with uh, bile solids and, and manure or bile solids specifically is the lack of um, uh, outbreaks associated with land up, uh, applied bile solids. And the reason for this is the very many out, uh, uh, regulations outlawed, outlined by EPA. Uh, and these are just a few of them here, and I won't go through them too, too detailed there. You do see some outbreaks associated with parasites and uh, uh, not really viruses, but you do see them with parasites. And these are all manure-borne uh, uh, cryptosporidium outbreaks, particularly the famous one in Milwaukee in 1993. 400,000 cases uh, happened uh, in that uh, particular outbreak. 
Uh, notice there aren't any viral outbreaks, and that's uh, just simply because of the, uh, the controls that EPA has put on, on biosolids application, uh, particularly when you can apply uh, biosolids, how you apply it, uh, where and to what kind of food crops you apply it, and harvesting times and wait periods and, and such. One last thing I want to hit on uh, before we finish is, is uh, risk. This is one thing I do a lot of, is calculate uh, uh, risk assessment associated with some of these exposures. And this is a situation where it's um, assuming a crop ingestion uh, that occurs seven days post application of uh, bile solids, raw sludge, and swine manure contaminated with enteroviruses and salmonella. And really the only reason I'm putting, put the, putting these up here is that I want to show you the uh, influence of treatment. Uh, you have raw sludge uh, risk at 8% chance of infection. When you treat it uh, with bio, uh, treat it with the typical biosolids treatments, uh, you can drop that risk by half. Uh, compare this risk to this risk, and you see that uh, there's the influence of uh, the difference between viral infectivity versus bacterial infectivity, and you can see. Assuming uh, equivalent exposures, you can see that the viruses are just far more effective than uh, salmonella, than the bacteria. Uh, one thing I want to point out, uh, in this situation of uh, class B biosolids, uh, nor raw sludge would ever be used on fresh food crops, especially seven days uh, uh, you know, prior to harvesting. Uh, it would never be used this way, but it, for simulation purposes, it's nice to, to show that. So with that, I'm going to end and leave you with a few talking points, a few take-home points. Uh, for the most part, there, there are viruses in manure. Uh, there's quite a few. Uh, uh, Dr. Aloy talked about those, and, and uh, there are viruses there, but for the most part, they're not necessarily important or, or infectious to humans. Uh, those viruses are actually found in class B bile cells, the ones that are infectious to humans. Parasites are found in both uh, manure and, bi and bile solids. Uh, they can be uh, uh, present uh, in there, but the levels that we're finding nowadays for viruses and parasites is that the, the levels are dropping in both uh, manure and uh, uh, bile solids, and that's really healthier animals, better treatment processes, better understanding of, of how to deal with these manures and bile solids, uh, which is dropping our, our numbers. The last thing I want to leave you with as you head off to your vacations is uh, remember to wash your hands. You never know uh, what happened to the person that you're shaking hands with uh, or, uh, or uh, picking up your, your hamburger meal from the, the, the restaurant. Uh, you never know. So wash your hands before you eat anything. Uh, uh, from one microbiologist to the rest, I would say, please wash your hands. And with that, I'll end. <laughs>